service. Uh, welcome to the visitors. Glad you're here with us. Also to those that are joining us online, welcome. We're glad you can be here. We're thankful today. Sarah did make it back from Jamaica this evening, so she's here with us. Glad to have her uh, with us. The title of my message today is Victory Over Anxiety. And um, the Lord laid this message on my heart um, about a month ago. And we are going to start in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, so you can open your Bibles to that. Um, I did not plan to continue the Sunday school lesson when I started studying this. But when Larry and I switched Sundays to preach, um, it landed on the same spot. So the Lord has a way of working things out, and we're excited about what he has for us today. And no, I'm not going to do what Jason said. I'll let him get up here afterward in testimony and maybe do that or something. Um, but I will say I do have uh, a little different format today. I would like to go into testimonies in the middle of my message, and I'm going to give you an assignment right now to get out your pen and write down a few questions that I have here. And I would like you to respond to this. So, verse 9, I'm just going to read that to begin, then we'll stand and read the whole passage. It says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And last Sunday when I gave a testimony, I shared that this week. I would love to hear from some of you about uh, people that you have both learned and received and heard and seen. What those things are. Maybe it's a tribute that you want to make to a parent. Maybe it's someone else sitting here in church that, wow, you heard this from them or you learned this from them, and it has impacted you, and it guides your life. Maybe it's someone that's passed on. I looked out to the graveyard out there, and as we know, uh, since COVID began, our church has uh, laid to rest nine people uh, in the last three years, four of those in the last year after COVID. So we've been impacted not only by those of us who are here, but by those who have gone on before us. And so these are the four things I want you to write down. How did they live? What did you hear them say? What did they teach us? And what did they give us? And I want you to keep that. And when we get to that point in the message, I'm going to open it up. And as Paul says... You know, if one has something better to say, the first one should sit down. So this is your chance today to take over, uh, if you would like. Uh, we will uh, we'll just close the message down and you can continue. But be thinking, I would like to hear from some of you, what are some things you've seen and heard and been taught and received that impact your life? And it can be in connection here, or it can be uh, in connection to someone that has impacted your life. Let's stand together and we'll read, we'll read our whole passage together. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9 through 23. We're going to read the whole thing. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed 
from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smelling, sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the life of Paul. And Lord, that we can learn of him. And thank you for the life of the body of Christ for the life of this body, for those that are being faithful that others can look on to and say, I want to be like that. And I pray that you'd help each one of us to be more like you so we can say that. And today, as we look into your word, just give us wisdom and give us grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Yes. So, uh, Jared asked if I could repeat the four questions. How did they live? What did we hear them say? What did they teach us? And what did they give us? So when the microphones come around, you have something to share. So my title is Victory Over Anxiety, and what I'm looking at here is the life that Paul lived that allowed him and and like Ed shared you know the beginning of this chapter as we had talked about before rejoicing in the Lord always uh, Paul was writing to the Philippians here and it and it said that those first verses in chapter 4 are some of the greatest mental health statements in scripture is if we can live by that uh, we can have positive uh, outcome. Paul is writing to the Philippians here, and this is a church that he's very deeply connected to, and he loves them very much. And we know that his experiences started, you know, when he was came and saw a vision, and he came to Macedonia, from Macedonia to Philippi, because he saw a man beckoning him to come. So he went and followed, and there he found the women uh, praying by the riverside, and he taught them. And then he was put in prison for uh, t uh, casting out that demon from the young lady that was doing divination for the goddess Dinah. And the merchants lost their business. And so Paul went to prison. And in prison, we know the story how at midnight he sang praises and gave glory to God with Silas, who was with him, and their feet were in the inner prison in the stocks, and they were fastened there. But those came off, and the jailer would have killed himself, except that Paul said, we're all here. Do yourself no harm. We're all here. And he went in, the jailer washed their uh, stripes, and they cleaned them up, and that night they led them to the Lord. So, this is the context where uh, Paul is giving us this message in the Philippians. So, I have four points today, and the first one in victory over anxiety is do the right things. And the second one is to be content with what we have. The fourth is to believe that we can do all things in Christ, which strengthens us, and then trust in God to supply all our need. Now, you'd think 
when the Lord gives you a message with that kind of title that you would be free of anxiety that week as you're preparing it. Uh, let me tell you, I, I struggled with more anxiety based on an outdoor wedding coming up and based on uh, other things that happened this week that we'll just leave out there. But, um, you know, your children can make you worry even after they leave the home and get married. You're not done. Young, young families, it just goes on, okay? So, um, but the beauty is that God, God had to talk to me and help me live this out. But I want to start with Paul's life and what he says in verse 9. He says, do those things that you've heard. And I want to do that with Paul. I want to look at Paul's life here. What did Paul do? Why could he say, follow me? Well, I think the first thing is that we're going to look at is what the Philippians had seen him do. What had they seen him do? Well, number one, the first thing we know in Acts chapter 16 is where you can read this story, is where Paul followed the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit said to him, don't go over here, but come to Philippi through the man beckoning him, Paul obeyed and went. So the first right thing that the Philippians had seen in Paul is that he followed the Holy Spirit. And the question comes to me, do I follow the Holy Spirit? Last week, Larry challenged us. Are you ministering right where you are? Do you speak for Jesus where you are? And this week, God gave me an opportunity, and it was a tremendous joy to just remember what Larry said. I walked in a gas station, and it was like, Tell the folks in here that God loves them. And he's like, well, this should be easy for a pastor to do. It's easier to come up here and preach almost sometimes than to just follow that Holy Spirit prompting in the little things. But this is who Paul was. This is what they had seen him do. So I want to say thanks to Larry for that challenge. So the first thing we see about him is he followed the Holy Spirit. Do you and I... Give the Holy Spirit the place in our lives that He deserves and that He is the Lord of our lives. The second thing we see that Paul did was he confronted evil. Notice that in chapter 16, and we're not turning them, I'm just referring to this story, but as they went to the river to pray, this lady would come up to them and say, these are men of the Most High and would disturb it. And Paul put up with this for a couple days, but then he had enough, and he said to that spirit, he said, you need to be gone in the name of Jesus. And the spirit left that girl, and she could not do the, uh, give the proclamations for the future anymore for her masters. Now, you might say, well, Brother Judd, I'm not going to go out there and do those kind of things. We're not going to go out there and in the name of Jesus, be gone. And I, that's not what I'm asking you. But I'm asking you this question. Do you and I confront evil when we see it? What about our homes? You know, today, back in the day, and, and this brought me to the point of, you know, we are working on our statement of application practice. I promise you as pastors, are still working on that. It's been a long process. We keep getting together and taking what you all gave us and, and working on parts of it and keep moving through. There will come a day where we'll, we'll bring out what, what we've heard and brought out. But one of the subjects is media in there. You know, you could write it in a certain way where it was like, don't do this at one time. But today there's all kinds of ways things come in our homes. And it's like as a church, it almost makes no sense to say, don't do this, don't do that. But the question I have is, do we confront the evil that can come into our homes through access to media? Are you, am I, a safeguard as a father, as an individual, to those things 
that want to come into our lives. Paul said, do as I did. He confronted evil. Do you and I, well, we just turn a blind eye. That's a, that's a kind of, ah, um, oh, that movie or that media, yeah, it has some evil in it, but, you know, we can ignore that. We can move on past it. Well, maybe you can, but what about your children? I don't know. Those are challenges that face me. This is what Paul did. He, he confronted evil. And he was, he was rejoicing in his circumstances. You know, and when evil came to him, he sang in the prison versus just giving in to it. The second thing is, he, he also rejoiced in the Lord no matter what his circumstances. Those, the third thing um, is that he rejoiced in Christ no matter his circumstances. In the prison, he, he praised God. And that question comes to me like, can I, when I start feeling anxious and I start feeling those pangs of worry and what's going to happen with this, can I stop and recognize that Christ is in control and I can praise Him no matter what. I mean, it would be very difficult to sit in prison and think, Lord, you sent us here, you gave us a mission to do here, and now my feet are in the stocks. What am I going to do? It's not working out. I thought you told me to come here, Lord. And I'm here. This isn't part of the plan. But no, Paul and Silas just said, hey, let's sing together. If you want to change your circumstances in the middle of darkness, sing. And I can give testimony to that. I was, once we were uh, working with a group of boys uh, at the boys camp when I was there, and we were right outside the office, and we had been struggling. This one boy was acting up all day long, and every time we tried to talk, it was almost... It was so reactionary and so difficult. He would just like scream at us and, it, and he would get the other boys discouraged to where they wouldn't want to help anymore. It was really, really a difficult situation. We'd been praying and praying. And finally, uh, it was staff meeting time for the rest of the staff. And they went and one of the members that had been with us with that group of boys went up to staff meeting and, and said we pray. But they began to sing in staff meeting. And as they began to sing, that boy changed his attitude. I cannot explain to you how it happened, except there is a spiritual power in us giving praise to God. And this happened in this prison too. And so we don't, we don't worship God based on our feelings. We worship God based on the truth of His Word and who He is. And I've got to give credit uh, to a preacher I heard on the radio this week uh, that spoke to this that really challenged me. Is We get on our knees in obedience to submit to Christ. We might not feel submissive, but as we get on our knees to pray, submission of our heart follows. We often have to practice the truth and do the right thing and our emotions and our, and our hearts will follow. And I'm not trying to stand here and say, well, do the works and do this. But there is a point to where as, as people of God, God honors our actions when we are obedient and faithful. And we can see that with Abraham. Abraham obeyed God and it was imputed unto him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. It was based on his obedience. Another thing that they had seen Paul do was they saw him go where God was working. So he went, a man motioned him to come, and he found women at the riverside. Well, this isn't men. I'm not going to stay here. No, he stopped there, and he started praying with the women at the riverside. And God built a church out of that. So this was, these are the things that they saw in Paul. They saw that he was obedient in the Spirit. 
They saw that he found people where God was working and worked with them, that he was willing to confront evil, and that he rejoiced in Christ no matter what. Those are the things that the Philippians had seen in him. So do we follow the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is our provision. The Greek word for Holy Spirit is like paraclete. You know, paraclete was a term for the Roman soldiers. When the Roman soldiers got into battle, they got trained to stand back to back and fight for each other. And the guy at your back was called your paraclete. He was there fighting, protecting your backside while you were fighting and protecting his backside. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete of our life. He has our back. He's for us. He's a comforter. But much more than a comforter, he's the one who's protecting us. And we can trust him. He's our provision. Think of that word, provision. A pronoun, a prefix, something before, comes before a word. Pro means ahead. And vision Put the two together. The provision of the Holy Spirit is He sees ahead. He knows what's coming. You can trust His work in your life. He knows. All right. The next thing we see uh, that Paul, it says, the things which you have seen in me. And now we're going to see uh, what things that Paul gave them. And I, I put down here, Paul gave them affirmation and prayed for them. How many of you like words of affirmation? We, I think we all do. I mean, I won't make you raise your hand. But think about, what do words of affirmation do to you? Paul gave words of affirmation to the Philippians. He said, he thanks God upon every remembrance of them. Always in every prayer of mine, making requests with you for joy, with joy. So he loved these people. He gave them affirmation. And he also gave them this, this word. Prayers were there for them. And also he said, I am confident, in verse 6 of chapter 1, that the one who began the good work in you is going to continue it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can see that Paul gave affirmation and he prayed for them. Their question is, you know, if we are going to be free from anxiety, we have to have people pray for us. It's not real easy for me to pick up the phone or text somebody and say, hey, I, I just need prayer right now. That does not come naturally for me. I'll gladly pray for someone. But it is really hard for me to send you a text and say, I'm struggling, can you pray for me? That's very difficult for me to do. But we need the prayers of each other. Are we praying for each other and are we affirming each other in Christ like Paul did to them? So that was what he gave them. He taught them to have the attitude of Jesus Christ. So he, what they saw in him and then what he taught them was to have the attitude of Jesus Christ. And you will find that in chapter 2. is where Paul taught them to have the attitude of Jesus. That Jesus was not afraid to be equal with God. He was who God made him. He did not deny that he was the Son of God. He embraced that he was God. But he was humble and gave himself. And Paul was teaching them that in the church, if we're going to get along, if we're going to be free from things in the church, we have to have this attitude of Jesus. Number four, the Philippians heard Paul tell his story in chapter three. He almost brags in chapter three. If you've ever read, you know, if you say you have something in the church, look at me. I was this and I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews and a Pharisee and concerning the law, I was blameless. And it almost seems like Paul is bragging there, but he says no. All those things that I was so diligent in, I put behind me. And I said, they're not worth anything. And I don't want those. 
because I want to know Christ and only Him. It was all loss compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And his whole goal in life was to know Christ, the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His suffering, being conformed to death, to His death. So we see here that Christ, that Paul laid the foundation to be free from anxiety by living a life where we're doing the right things. Because he's just told them that think on what's true. Keep your mind clear. What's true, what's honest, what is just, and what's pure. Keep your mind on those things. And then to do those things that they had seen in him. So at this time, I'm going to give you opportunity. Um, that was what the Philippians had seen in Paul, that he followed the Holy Spirit, that he was willing to look where God was working and join there and work with that, that he was willing to confront evil, and that he was willing to rejoice no matter what his circumstances. Matter of fact, the book of Philippians has the word joy or rejoice 18 times. Uh, so he really brought that out. But I want to open it. Has, has someone impacted how you, how they have lived? Or what they've said to you? So, uh, ushers, maybe we'll take a moment. And I'm just going to open it up for people to, to share someone who's maybe impacted your life. Go ahead. Well, there's, there's been a lot of people who have impacted my life and influenced me. But when I think of, the, of an impact like the Apostle Paul might have had, I, I think of one individual, well, three individuals. One was my father and mother who impacted me a great deal. But outside of that, I would have to say that Yos Miller was, has, was the greatest impact on my life. And I don't have it exactly categorized as you have here because I scribbled it as I was thinking about the things that he impacted me with. He, he lived a, a simple life. Okay. He was not a simple person. He, he was a, a, actually a rather complex person and a very uh, uh, brilliant individual. Uh, but he lived a simple life. And the... Th a couple of the things that he said that impacted me throughout life, still does, is, and one of them was his, his emphasis on the importance of the body, uh, the body of Christ, of each other, our relationships with each other, so very, very important. He, he taught me principles. Mm -hmm. He didn't just give me applications, but he taught me principles. One of those principles was a principle of forgiveness something that uh, we all need. Uh, and and he, he taught forgiveness, not just in his words, but I saw him demonstrate it as well. Um, and then he, he did give me application by his actions. He, he also gave me something that has stayed with me, and that is the desire to know God's word. Mm -hmm. And that that the Word of God is more important than my experience. Yeah. It's, it's what the, the, guy, the Bible says, what the Word says yeah, that is important. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bill. Brother Nelson. Okay. Uh, there's many things that I could say. A lot of people that have been influenced in my life. Uh, first of all, it's my mother and father, which are both laying out here in the grave. Uh, just uh, they have taught me how to live, they taught me, taught, they, I, I can't even read my notes. <laughs> uh, they were mission-minded, uh, and one thing that I want to read, my mother told me when I was uh, 
19, leaving home, going into service. Uh, my mother gave me a verse, or two verses. She says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that the things that thou hast heard, and I, I, can't, I can't read because I've got so many tears in my eye. Anyway, I was told to be faithful, and they showed me how to be faithful. Yeah. And uh, they taught me honesty and truth. And what did they give me? They gave me hope and confidence. And that's, that's my tribute to them. Amen. All right, anyone else? I could verify what Bill shared about Brother Yost in my life. Uh, what an impact he had on my life in the time that we were together here. Yeah, amen. Go ahead. Well, I feel I have to follow up now. You have me on the spot from earlier. <laughs> I know we were kidding around, but, you know, I gave Judd a rough time. I said, you know, in that, that verse that we read, Paul was saying, to do as he does. I said, wouldn't that be a little boastful if we do that today? Like, I'd kind of think, you know, if Judd would be up here and say, you know, do as I do. You know, just live your life like I live my life. I'd be like, well probably could find a fault <laughs> yeah. you know Amen. so um but anyhow thank you for i think we can live a life like we can follow you judd thanks Praise for being that leader yeah. um and you you're allowed to post in it so um i do last sunday when you you were talking or when you gave us the assignment uh this person was sitting close to me and this person i think is not a boastful person and uh i was kind of taking the assignment for somebody in church here so um we heard the person speaking earlier this morning. It was Freddie. And Freddie, I know you weren't expecting me to maybe to talk about you, but Freddie was my first small group leader. And it was at a very impactful time in my life coming Praise to Lord. Bethel here. And uh, I've always respected Freddie, and I learned a lot from Freddie. And now I lead a small group, and not nearly to the, to the uh, degree that Freddie led the small group uh, then. But uh, I really have appreciated what you've done, in sp what you've lived out and showed in your life to me. It's meant a lot to me, and I, and I think I see you giving t uh, your heart to a lot of things, uh, especially I know you're involved in the, the school, and I see you have that giving heart and want to share good to those around you. Thank you for living that life. Thanks, Jason. All right. Yeah, my grandpa, Roman, he was an Amish bishop. He let a lot of mind on my mind. I even dream about him today yet, and he's gone 36 years. Wow. And uh, what really stands out to me is his honesty. Okay. How he always taught me to be honest. That stands today yet for me. Thank you, Irvin. Good to, good to hear that, yeah. All right, I picked uh, three people, and they're here today. So my the three that, that have impacted me is Brother Bill, uh, Brother Mark, and then also Nelson here. So if you ask the question, what did you hear them say? Uh, for, from Bill, this is one of the things that I remember is don't comp compartmentalize in how you do things. Uh, do it as unto God and build it right. From Mark, uh, I think one of the things that really stuck out to me already is his patience and then also to be sold out, uh, be 110 percent. And if uh, you think of Nelson, there's probably a lot of us here that when you first came to Bethel, uh, one of the things you might have heard Nelson say is great to have you here. Mm -hmm. My name is Nelson. What's yours or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So uh, what did they teach? Uh, one of the things that, that I remember from Bill was personal conviction and leadership. Uh, the emphasis on personal conviction uh, from Mark is the personal your personal spiritual development and missions and from Nelson hospitality and so what did these three give me I think they gave all, all of us I guess a great example and a roadmap to live by so mm -hmm. thank you to you to you guys thank you anyone else
I, uh, good to be here. Thank you, Judd. One of the people that impacted my life was Betty's father, Freeman. And uh, I always often heard him say, the way up is down, the way down is up. And uh, he lived that. He lived out what he said, and that's, uh, he, in, in living it out, that's what he taught. And uh, through that, he gave us a legacy that we cherish. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Well, thank you for that. Now we'll do the second half of the message, all right? You all ready? Actually, we'll close her up here. I just want to, uh, I'll come back to the second half of this message later because I just really appreciated uh, hearing. We, we made it through one verse today. We got a bunch more to go, but we'll come back to the points of being content no matter what and knowing that we can do everything through Christ and knowing that God will supply all our need. And if you notice that verse, it does not say supply all our needs. It says supply all your need. And that thought, that Greek word for need there is, uh, if I can pronounce it, kiara, chimera. I'm not getting it right. I'll get it right when I preach it. But anyway, the thought is the gap in your life. The Holy Spirit will supply all your need, will supply and close the gap in your life. If you could close the gap in your life, a lot of our other needs would go away, wouldn't they? So there's some exciting things to dig into in the Word here in the second half of this message. But I just want to close today with the words at the end of verse 9, and the God of peace shall be with you. If you and I are going to have victory over anxiety, we need to have a foundation in our life like we heard from Paul. And our life needs to be built on a solid foundation. If you want anxiety, go into a house with a terrible foundation and think of remodeling it. Where will you start? What's worth doing what isn't worth doing? If there's no foundation there, you can forget about what you're going to do with the rest. You have to start with a foundation. And Paul gave us a foundation. We heard today, and thank you for sharing. A lot of times we want to share with, about people who are past and gone. But we need to hear it today. We need to hear it from each other. Encourage each other. How are we impacted in our lives? How powerful is that? to share with each other how the foundation of your life impacts me. So thank you for doing that today. But on that foundation, if we live, the promise is that the God of peace will be with us. We can trust when we build our lives on Christ that he will be with us. And so that is one of the largest keys to overcoming anxiety. And, and we also know that being content, knowing that we can do everything through Christ and believing he'll supply our need is also important. But we're going to close with that. Let's stand together and we're going to have a word of prayer and we're going to do it as a closing since we had our testimonies already and get you home on Memorial Day weekend here. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you so much for your presence. Thank you that we can have freedom from anxiety through you, that we can have a foundation in our lives that's built upon you. Lord, thank you that the promise of your peace with us, that you are the God of peace and that you are with us, that we can go in that. Bless us now and guide us as we go. Continue to watch over us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jason, would we have a song to close out? The power in the name of Jesus, we've got.
God bless you. Have a great day.